Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome uh, you all to this to this uh, ongoing town hall congressional uh, series, where we have an opportunity to go one on one with the congressional representative in your particular district. This evening, we will be joined shortly by uh, Congressman Sean Caston of the uh, sixth district. As you all know, um, with the elections and <clears throat> with the census and then now the reapportionment, the actual boundaries now for this district will extend further uh, through the Southwest suburbs to include areas such as Bridgeview, uh, Tinley Park, uh, and Burbank, et cetera. So there's a wider base of, of Muslims gonna be included in this particular uh, new, uh, is this new refashioned district. And this evening, as, I, as we say, we're gonna have an opportunity to hear firsthand from the, uh, the current uh, congressional representative for the sixth district, uh, Sean Kasten. Uh, Congressman Kasten has been with us on, on many occasions uh, at prior, not only as part of the town hall series, but other, other events that we have held. So this will give us an opportunity uh, as we look forward to the upcoming elections, but also to understand uh, clearly how uh, Congressman uh, Kasten has best represented the interests of not only the Muslim community, but the, the, all the residents of the sixth district. Um, you will, we will be joined this evening by a number of panelists. All of these are representatives uh, or individuals who live and reside in the in this, uh, sixth district as it is made up to give you a cross section of opinions, views, and questions uh, from the those constituents of the sixth district to bring forth to Congressman Cast, uh, Kasten the issues that are, are of concern, the interests that the Muslims wish to express. These town hall series provide you, our uh, community, an opportunity to have this, uh, uh, to meet with your local representative so that you can actually engage with that person, understand how they're representing you. It's not as it will not be a situation where you only see them at election time. In addition, the the in addition to the uh, town hall series, this all this uh, is a part of the CLGC's Civic Engagements Committee ongoing uh, process to keep you as a, a voter educated, engaged, and empowered. Uh, come March 30th, we will be holding virtually our annual uh, uh, Illinois Muslim Action Day, IMAD, and where we'll be inviting state and local representatives uh, to address issues that will form our, formulate our platform and how to push various policies that advance the interests of our community forward through the legislature in, in Springfield. Um, and I'm not sure, uh, Sana, I can't see it. Has, has Congressman uh, Kasten joined us as of yet? Yes, he's here. Yes, I'm here. Oh, great, great. All right, well, <clears throat> at this particular point in time, I wanted to give you a, a background, once again, remind you the importance of the town hall series, uh, the importance of civic engagement work, and uh, again, invite you to not only participate in our town hall series, but in the other activities uh, of the civic engagement committee, just uh, please send us an email at info at CIOGC.org. We will reach out to you and provide you with our other opportunities that the, the committee is engaged in so that you can become a more informed and engaged <laughs> voter in the state of Illinois. So at this point in time, I would like to now release the, the platform and turn it over. Uh, to our moderator for the uh, uh, the evening, Samarine Khan. Samarine. Assalamu alaikum, everyone, and good evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, a quick introduction on Congressman Kasten, and then we'll hear a few words from him. 
Congressman Sean Kasten represents Illinois' sixth congressional district located in Chicago's western and newly added southwest suburbs. He is serving in the 117th Congress. First elected in 2018, he is the first Democrat to represent the sixth district in nearly 50 years. The Congressman is committed to fighting to build a brighter, brighter more sustainable future. Since taking office, he has introduced and co-sponsored legislation in support of clean energy, women's rights, protections for seniors, and universal health care, among other critically important issues. Sean currently serves on the House Financial Services Committee, the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, the Select Climate Crisis Committee, and is co-chair on the New Dems Climate Change Task Force. Want to hand it over to Congressman Kasten now for um, a few words. Thank you so much, Samreen and uh, Abdullah, and nice to see so many friends here, um, even though I can't see most of you, but um, I'm just grateful for all that, uh, all the history and all that you guys at CIOGC do. You know, I think I first became aware of you guys through my, my friend Anthony Simpkins when he and I were in the Chicago Council Emerging Leaders Program together and all the good work that he's done and you've done on, on housing equity. Um, the all of the civic engagement that you did when I was first running for Congress, events like these, getting people registered, participating, understanding our elections, you know, it would have been so easy for all of us as a country after the 2016 election to lose hope. And and you didn't. Um, you doubled down, you organized, you got people registered, and we would not have have done as much as we've done in these last few years if if you hadn't done that. And I, I don't say that I'm not blowing smoke. I mean it. Like we we get there because people step up, and and then of course all the good work you did and all the, your charitable actions that were tragically necessary through this COVID period and are still necessary. Um, and whether that was getting getting masks and PPE available or all the food pantries, I've lost track of how many times I've seen some of your youth groups out um, working at food pantries and getting things to folks in need. So you know I I thank you for that. Um, because it's the fabric of what makes America great. Um, you know, it's people coming together, you know, not, not in Congress to tell everybody what to do, but coming together through their mosques, their churches, their temples, their local chambers of commerce um, to work for the common good because we all as Americans always, always, always have more in common than, than we do that divides us. But, you know, almost as often we need to remind ourselves of that. So I, I thank you for reminding ourselves all of that. Um, my own work, you know, somebody mentioned my committees, um, the Financial Services Committee, we oversee essentially the entire banking sector of the country and much of the housing sector. So get involved in a lot of those policies, obviously coming as a, you know, as an engineer by training and an entrepreneur, um, I find myself in the position of trying to make sure that uh, that we simply prioritize cheap, cheap and clean energy and get rid of the disconnects in our system to get it done as someone who comes from a background of understanding not just the science, but also the practical implications around um, the business issues. I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. But there's, there's, a, there's a fulcrum there between the climate and the financial services because anything we do to lower our CO2 emissions leads to che cheaper energy. And anything we do to truly embrace cheaper energy is massively economically dislocative for an awful lot of folks in our country who depend on resource extraction. Um, we're creating more winners than losers, but those gains are not going to be shared equitably through society if we're not careful. So spend a fair amount of time um, working on those issues. And basically, basically the strong word, trying to make sure that as a country, we live up to our values. Um, I'm, it's impossible to be in this job, especially over the three years I've served that's been through three impeachments and a near miss of a great depression and a, and a global pandemic, um, January 6th. It's impossible not to be here and spend time thinking about our history. And, you know, I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer of that great quote of Frederick Douglass when he said, the best friend of a nation is he who most faithfully rebukes her for her sins and he, her worst enemy, who under the specious garb of patriotism seeks to excuse, palliate, or defend them. And we're at this moment right now where we're not perfect as a country. We've done some things that are pretty great, but we're not perfect. And, you know, sort of like someone hiking up a mountain, we, you know, we need to constantly take some pride in how far we've come. Um, but not delude ourselves about how far we still have to go. And 
you know, I was talking to some high school students today and I was saying that if I, if there was only one thing that I wish you could understand about our country, yeah. it's to understand that in 1776, we had a bunch of people who got together and said, we declare it self-evident that sometimes it's appropriate to shed the political bind, bonds. And who were they to say that? They didn't get democratically elected, right? But they just said, sometimes it's appropriate to rise up and overthrow your government. And then those same people in 1789 got together and created a whole new government and said, we need everybody to come together. And they had to try to figure out how to convince people to come together. And they did that by creating a constitution that solved some problems and kicked some other ones down the road. We claim that all men were created equal, but we didn't really make all men equal. We didn't really have a conversation about women. Um, and we've gotten a little bit better about that, but we still have a long way to go. So I think, um, you know, on that long way to go, we still have tremendous inequities in this country. Certainly from a wealth perspective, we have as much inequity as we've ever had and all the consequences that go with that. That doesn't mean that, you know, the poorest person in America isn't a lot wealthier than the richest person was in America 100 years ago. But that relative position creates an awful lot of need and hunger and mental health issues that we have to deal with. We are still not even close on climate. If we signed into law, everything in the Build Back Better Act that is still necessary to do, it would be about half of what's necessary. And we have to be very cold eyed and realistic about that. Um, and globally, um, we have to prove to the world that the US is the country we claim to be. We, when I was in Madrid as part of the delegation on the climate conference, and then when I went back to Glasgow, there was such a change in the way we were treated when we were back in Glasgow after the end of the Trump era that we were back. But there was also such a deep skepticism of we don't know if you're going to hold on to this because the rest of the world has watched you know, this rise of authoritarianism around the world, you know, in whether that's Viktor Orban or the rise of Modi in India, um, you know, Putin in Russia. And yes, they've seen it in our country too. And historically, they have relied on us to be the defender of the world order, the defender of democracy, the defender of law. And they're wondering right now if we're still going to play that role. And, you know, the Chinas and the Russias of the world are anxious to tell the rest of the world that we're not going to. And so I think the question we have as Americans right now is, is you know, to, to hope and do everything in our power to make sure that Abraham Lincoln was right. There was that line that Lincoln had at the end of the Civil War when he was asked, um, I think Grant asked him, did you ever doubt for a moment that you'd be able to save the Union? And he said, I never doubted because there was always just enough virtue in the nation to save it. Sometimes none to spare, but always just enough. And it's a beautiful quote as read from this side of the Civil War. Um, but as we're now sitting here for, for the second time in our history since Fort Sumter, where we've been attacked from within, attacked by people who believed the spirit of the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence and did not believe the spirit of the men who wrote the Constitution. But when you don't like the outcome of a democratic election, you should just overturn it. The question is, is there enough virtue in the nation to save it right now? And I can't answer that question because I don't have the power to answer it, but all of us collectively do. And so I'll close where I started. Thank you to the CIOGOC for, for being that voice to connect from the bottom up, to get people to understand that we're all in this together because that's where that virtue comes from. And I'm grateful for, for all that you do um, in our community to make that happen. So I'm sure you have a ton of questions, but um, I hope that's a useful, um, at least tee up and eager to, um, continue the conversation. Sure. Thank you so much, Congressman, for that beautiful introduction. Um, we have um, our format. We will go through questions our panelists have um, drafted, would like to ask, and then we'll open the floor to our participants. Um, if you have any questions, please, if you can write your <coughs> questions in the Q&A box rather than the chat screen, and I'll go through and I'll pick them up. So our first question is from Zach, who's from ICNA Relief. Zach, would you like to take the floor? Yes, that's all. Good evening, Congressman Keston. Um, my name is Zach. As somebody just mentioned, I would relief. As you all know, you know has served over 65,000 individuals in Page and in the Chicago area in 2021. 
we provide comprehensive social and financial services for all of these individuals. Agencies like Relief, who are providing services on a daily basis, are in great need of funding and ongoing support. I'm My Jack. first question to you is what can you do to make sure that these grassroots agencies receive the support from Congress and are being heard? Yes. You're cutting, it's a little no. um, cut out. Do you mind if, do you want me to just read it real quick for him? It's I, cutting out. I, I, I think I caught, can you hear it? I, okay. I think I caught the gist of it. Yeah, the, the connection was cutting out, but about what to make sure that the that, that ICNA and organizations like ICNA have, have the resources to provide local community aid and charitable services. Was that the gist of your question, Zach? Yes, right. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, um, so I it, it, thank you again. And you know, as I said in my opening remarks, I've, I've lost track of how many times I've been working at a food pantry and seen a bunch of young people with ICNA t-shirts. So I thank you for all that you've done. We, we put massive amounts of money um, through the, you know, through the CARES Act into relief services, both in, you know, suspending, you know, suspending foreclosures and, and making sure that people couldn't be evicted, huge amounts of food aid um, to try to get that turned around and connecting with some of our farmers who couldn't get resources to market. Um, and, you know, it, it made a huge difference, the, you know, getting, getting schools in a position to distribute food. Did we do enough? Um, you know, as long as there's still some somebody hungry, I, I doubt it. Um, I I hope Zach that you didn't that your question doesn't suggest that you had any difficulty in accessing those aid programs, um, because certainly we were we were working overtime to try to make sure that those those programs were getting to the people with boots on the ground who could actually make sure it got into the affected communities. And if there's things we can do better, because I'm sure we weren't perfect, um, please let us know and hopefully we'll learn something that we don't ever have to use again, because I don't want to see um, that much free fall in society. But I don't, um, it's, it's not my understanding, unless you tell me to the contrary, that, that, that there was anything about the aid that would have, um, would have in any way constrained your access to those resources. Is, are there, is my understanding of your question different from that, or were, did you have someone to those programs? No, and I do hope you can hear me. And my question was mainly to um, continue the ongoing support and the funding that we so deserve and, and need. So it was just uh, as far as you are concerned, how Congress can continue to support us and how we'll be heard. Yeah. Thank you. And I do have a second question. My if, is, if I could just add one more thing on that, Zach. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Specific, specific to food aid, one of the things that happened through COVID that I think we we learned about gaps in our system and improve them, and I hope we keep them, is so many of the food pantries historically have depended on the, you know, the food producers to give them excess supply. And they really don't have access to nutritionally complete meals. You know, it's really hard to get fresh produce at a food pantry or much less, you know, baking supplies and staples that you need to cook with, but it's easy to get boxes of Fruit Loops. And when we had the, the sort of the fall off in both in the, you know, the delivery systems through, through the COVID period and some, some of the agricultural systems, we were able to staple that with some of the farm aid programs. And I'm, I'm sure, as you know, those, those boxes, those CFAT boxes that actually got, you know, good fresh produce and, you know, and meats and all the things that people needed into those boxes. And increasingly, a lot of folks like the Northern Illinois Food Pantry that really got to tailor that was hugely useful. And I think one of the questions we have right now is how do we, how do we maintain that? Because if we go back to the world where folks are going back to the food pantries and saying, okay, this is great, but now I'm, I'm eating a lot of processed food again, we've, we've missed something. But I think it's a challenge to do that. And we've got some great you know, advocates for food pantries. But if you, if you have good ideas on that, let's keep in touch. Thank you. And I have another question to ask you as well. How can we work with your district office to keep an ongoing conversation on district refugee needs? Please identify how your office can help us continue providing these much needed services to the immigrants and the refugees that we serve. That we serve. Thank you. Um, so the really short answer is to please make sure that any resources and contacts you have get in touch with our office. We are you know, regularly working with constituents who need services and we are obviously, you know, a facilitator of resources in those cases. There's some, there are some terrific entities in the area like, you know, like World Relief and DuPage and others. Um, but you know, to the extent that we that you have services we can help connect to, 
um, and frankly, a sounding board would come through and follow up with us. My, my district director, Laura Schock, would be your first point of contact, but you can go through the website, casting.house.gov, and, and make sure that all of our, all of our caseworkers, you know, focus on immigration issues and others. Um, um, if they're not on a first name basis with the right people in your organization, they should be, and, and please follow up. Hey, thank you, Zach. Um, Congressman, I have a question regarding the resettlement of Afghani refugees. Thousands of Afghans remain on military bases awaiting processing and resettlement assistance. <laughs> All of them need housing, job training, and cohesive integration in the U.S. What policy initiatives have you developed to help these recent refugees? And I also recently learned about your relationship um, or, you know, with your family um, and a foundation that has been working with Fulbright Afghanis for a very mm -hmm. long time and just kind of how that ties together. If you're still in touch and, you know, what that means to you. Um, yeah, so let me maybe take your second question first. We have a, we have a, a, a small family foundation that long predates any kind of political job I had that's been focused on international education. And that's done, done a variety of things. Um, after 9-11, we did a, a five-year student scholarship um, uh, from Indonesia. We picked it as the largest Muslim country um, in the United States to facilitate intercultural exchange. And then after the US invaded Afghanistan, we set up a program to bring all of the Afghani Fulbrighters together in Hinsdale, Illinois um, for a long weekend to get to know each other because they had no way to contact each other in Afghanistan. And here often didn't have the resources to travel from Kansas State, University of Massachusetts, or they were studying. So it was a chance to connect them. Um, it was beautiful. It's been led to a lot of great friendships. And when, when, when Afghanistan fell apart last year, it was painful because all these people who we knew were sitting there saying, what can you do to get us out? And we, there's, there's no nice way, there's no clean way to leave a, leave a country, right? After 20 years there. And we were, you know, we were able to get some of those people on, on lists. We weren't able to get all of them on lists um, and try to get them evacuated. I had a, um, a, a, a conversation with one of the gentlemen who was able to make it through and came to visit my office um, who had become the, the Minister of Agriculture in the Afghani government. And these stories he told about the Taliban coming into his home, putting a gun in his face and saying, we know you're in the government and what are you gonna do? And he, he said he basically lived because he was able to explain to him all the things they did for folks in the community. And after he left the government and that let him get out and he's now in Los Angeles, last time I talked to him, trying to figure out how to get a job, right? And so we still have all this need. We got, I think, you know, a lot of the people out who we needed to, we had a really hard time with families and trying to get the, you know, the papers processed and extended families, mixed families were really hard because sometimes we didn't know, we that, you know, the, the, the government didn't know if those people were not responding because they couldn't respond or because they didn't want to respond because they looked at their mixed family and decided to stay there. Um, and, <clears throat> and it's hard. I wish I had a good answer to tell you what we're going to do, you know, for you know, for the rest of them. But I think we got into a situation tragically where, you know, we we fought a war for long too, far too long with no clear end sight. Um, we, I think, deluded ourselves into thinking that the government was robust in our absence. And then when President Biden came in, the troop count had been dropped so far that his only political choice was to go to the American people and say, we wanna wrap up troops indefinitely or ramp them down and deal with the collateral damage. And I think he took the least bad option, but it was a bad option. Um, and, I, and I wish I had a more precise answer beyond that, but much of what we've been doing is not legislative at this point. It's trying to, you know, as we identify people, can we find out if that person has an appropriate passport that they didn't find it necessary to destroy, to protect themselves, that they can get to a, you know, the right person and, and get out and it's, um, the, the, the conversations are heartbreaking. I agree. Um, we are going to change the, the course a little bit and go on to national, national issues. Um, we have, I, you might know, Kashif Akhil. He is from the Islamic Center of Naperville, and he's going to ask you some questions. Go ahead, Brother Kashif.
Good evening, Congressman. Hey, um, as you are aware, the Muslim community has faced Islamophobia in various forms over the years. A recent new source of Islamophobia in the United States is a hateful ideology called Hindutva, whose proponents call for the genocide of Muslims in India. What's really shocking though, is that there are many people in our local neighborhoods and yours who subscribe to this hateful ideology. So my question is one, what specific steps are being taken by the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security to identify and eliminate this threat to Illinois Muslims? And two, what is your office doing to help our community feel safe knowing that this threat is in Naperville and the surrounding suburbs? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, let, let us know anything we can do. Sometimes I think that, you know, the most powerful thing our office can do is be present. Um, the, and, and I don't, I don't say that to be dismissive, like showing up and, and sending a signal that this is the, sort of the behaviors, um, let us know how we can help to do that. Um, have certainly found it useful in a number of other circumstances. Um, I, I, I'm, I would be overstepping my grounds to say that I'm privy to everything that the FBI is doing. What I, what I will say an area that we have been very focused on in our office, um, which is, which is tricky, but it's a conversation that we need to have, is that the, the by far and away, if you define an act of terrorism um, as an act of violence perpetuated by a non-state actor in order to achieve a political end, then by far and away, the biggest terrorists who have ever served, worked on American soil is the Ku Klux Klan. And then you go through a whole bunch of other domestic terrorist groups before you ever get to anybody who's foreign. And the tools that we have to prosecute terrorism, as I've just defined it, tend to be foreign policy tools and not domestic policy tools. And, and it's a tricky issue within the civil liberties community, because if you go and you say, look, whatever you think about, you know, you know FISA wiretaps and other sort of prosecutorial tools, when we have those tools to go after people who are committing hate crimes and they are not from here, they are very different from the tools we have to prosecute it when they're, when they're Americans, whatever, whatever the shade of their skin is of the attacker and the, you know, and, and the defender. And so how do we, you know, we've, we've had a lot of things and, you know, letters we've bought and the bills we've been supporting of trying to make sure that we, that we, we prosecute domestic hate crimes in the same way we prosecute, um, uh, crimes by foreigners when, and still be respectful of civil liberties. And it's tricky, but we're working through that. The second piece, which I think is um, too often overlooked, is the role of social media. Because the a lot of what we're seeing in this rise of hate crimes in the U.S. has been driven by, by you know, Facebook type, type algorithms that, are, that are, are designed to drive engagement and therefore drive people to like-minded people. Um, the, the, the analogy that I, that I have found most resonant is that we can't confuse freedom of speech with freedom of reach. Because if I put an ad in my newspaper and I said, I, I would like to engage in some sort of Islamophobic activity, the newspaper could publish that and say, that's, a, that's covered by freedom of speech. And that would be under our civil liberties it okay. If the newspaper then change the headline in the paper delivered to my doorstep the next day to put something Islamophobic in the headline because they knew based on the ad I posted that I was receptive to that and then suggested that I go meet up with someone in real life who posted something similar in their classified section a year ago, we would say that's horrible, right? And yet that's exactly what these social media algorithms do. And so it's, you know, it's one thing to have individuals in our society who are, who are espousing these ideas. It's something else to have, have businesses that are making money by connecting those people and inciting them to go to, to darker and darker and more hateful places. And we've been doing a lot of things in the social media regulatory range um, to try to address that. Again, it's tricky because of civil liberties issues, but I think we have to we have to sail into those hard issues and cut and cut that off. Okay. So, so I guess, Samina, I think you're on mute. I wanted to make sure that you 
don't have any more follow-up questions or, you know, and that's okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, I do, but, you know, I, I guess the follow-up is that we should just work with your office. Is that for local, uh, local well, clients? Well, certainly for specific local local issues where there's a concern, um, you know, let us know how we can how we can get involved and in, in, in use our voice on that. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think every circumstance is going to be going to be different, so you know, I want to be, be careful where it is. But I, um, it's certainly not lost on me that some of, you know, some of the things we have seen, um, for political value in India has has spilled over into some of our our Indian expat community, um, you know, in in DuPage County. Yeah, yeah. it has. It truly has. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you, Brother Kashif. I'm not on mute anymore. So our next question is engagements with the Muslim community. Through diversification, we collectively build a better America. Muslims make up a significant segment in your congressional district, yet we do not see any Muslims represented in your staff. Will you commit to add a qualified Muslim in a substantive position in your Illinois or DC office? And they don't necessarily have to be just dealing with the Muslim community, but just someone to add a little bit more diversity in your staff, if you don't have one already. Well, um, we, we are at pains to make sure that we have a diverse staff um, and, uh, and, and a qualified staff and not, you know, and, and we've got, you know, a lot of gender diversity, religious diversity, ethnic diversity, um, and, and that's all a good thing. Um, if you're asking me, will I hire someone on the basis of their religion? Absolutely not. Right? <laughs> that's a, you know, that's a non-starter of a question. We have certainly had, particularly on the, on the campaign side, um, mostly just because the campaign side is a much bigger operation. The and this is an official side event. I'm wearing my pin, but there there are, there are very strict limits on how many roles you can have on the on the on the official side. Um, you can have a, a certain number of interns, and there's been some diversity there. But on the other hand, on the campaign side, you're constrained by you know how much money you can raise and, and how much you can go through. And so there there has been that diversity there. But I would say, if anybody in your in your community um, is interested in getting involved, please do so. Um, I, I should mention, and I know many of you have heard this story before, but the um, one of the first events that we did, and I'm trying to remember. Uh, is it the Islamic Center of Naperville? I'm forgetting which mosque it was. One of the questions from one of the students was, uh, and this was when I was back in the primary, he said, what are you going to do about genocide? And I remember thinking like, boy, that's a mean question to ask a first time member of Congress. Like that's way too complicated. And it was from uh, this young man, Zaman um, uh, uh, Qureshi from Hinsdale. And uh, Zaman became an intern in our office, worked through the campaign. When Senator Durbin came um, to meet with our staff, I said, do you have any questions for him? And he said, you need, and Zaman said, Senator Durbin, what made you decide to get into politics? And I said, Zaman, are you kidding me? Like you ask me how I'm gonna solve genocide? And you asked Durbin how I was gonna solve that. Um, I mentioned that because um, Zaman is now a student at American University. And if you've not followed his success, he's been working on the Facebook oversight board dealing with a lot of these issues that I was just talking about, about algorithmic control. He's doing this as a student, has gotten involved with a lot of doing FOIA requests. And he is now not an employee of our team, but is a huge resource as a, as a college student at American to our team in, in, and has worked with us on formulating questions for witnesses on committees and giving us background materials and just a great resource. Um, now, he happens to be a Muslim. That's not the reason that we hired him. He's there because he's an extremely smart and capable individual. Um, and we will continue to be a home for smart and capable individuals as we have hiring needs. Um, but again, I'm not going to hire somebody just because of their religion. I'm, there's a whole lot of problems with that. Hi, Mike. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, now we are going to get into a little bit of um, last time. I don't know if you remember, I was very easy on you um, a few months ago when I moderated um, a CIODC town hall. So this time I'm getting back at you. Okay. <laughs> Pressing you a little bit, not okay. too much. Okay, so we have Dr. Khalid, who's gonna ask um, his next question on international. Go ahead, Dr. Khalid. Hi, Congressman Kassim, thanks for joining us. Thank you for allowing me to uh, ask you the question. So this will be an inter international topic issue. Uh, we are concerned that basic human rights violations have been occurring against Palestinians in the region 
Yet Congress has not spoken up against the government of Israel. The Palestinians for decades lack access to clean water, health care, education, and oftentimes food. There are basic human rights declared under the Declaration of Human Rights that the U.S. is a signatory. So my question for you is, please state your position regarding the leadership of Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett. Also comment on Bennett's government policies regarding the property rights of Arabs living in Jerusalem and the treatment of Palestinians in the West Bank. That's it. Um, <laughs> uh, just a small little question. Um, <laughs> The uh, so let me first state that I am um, unabashedly um, a believer that we have to have two democratic states, um, the that are that are peaceful and are truly democratic, and that we don't have that right now. Um, I I cannot look at the you know at the history of the treatment of the Jewish people and and not feel that we need to make sure that they have they have a homeland they can live in or that it's acceptable for that to be um, anything other than a democratic state. The, I, have, I have traveled to the region once since being elected. I will actually be back in February on a separate group. And one of the, when I went the last time, this was before the current administration came in. So I, I, I met with Mahmoud Abbas. I also met with, um, with Netanyahu. And the overwhelming sense I got from both of them was that neither of them were committed to, to a true two-state two solution. Um, when, when we met with Netanyahu, we asked him directly, Are you, what is the path that you will commit to a two-state solution? And he said, I categorically refuse not to maintain um, a security force you know, you know, from the River Jordan to the sea and everywhere in between. And we said, look, at best, that's a one and a half state solution. That's now two states. We then met with Mahmoud Abbas, who um, proceeded to show us a map of Palestine that went from the Jordan River to the sea. And we said, how does this work with, with a two state solution? And he said, because I don't have any other map and this is what I have to do. And the, the hard part to deal with was sitting there and saying, what is in the best interest of all the people involved is not necessarily the best interests of the leaders on either side who seem to be working hard to remove the de degrees of freedom for the other party. The piece that was, I think the biggest gut punch on that trip was um, speaking with, a, with a, 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 fairly, a fairly sort of politically left Israeli Jew who said that, that he felt that in his youth, the, the overwhelming majority of, the, of Israeli Jews felt that there would not be regional peace unless they came up with a, with a long-term permanent democratic solution for the Palestinian people. And that, and that in the current environment, the, the belief on the, the politics on the ground believe that, the, that it's now the alternative, that there will not be any solution for, for the West Bank and Gaza until they have regional peace. And it was a gut punch because um, you know, a part of that, you know, in his characterization of the story, this was triggered by the Second Intifada. But as an American, we're sitting there saying a part of that is frankly what the U.S. did in the region, because it, what the, you know, what uh, Iraq was a horrible, you know, Saddam Hussein was a horrible person, but he, sitting between Iran and, and Israel um, provided a buffer that has now, you know, created a lot more meddling, and there's a sense within the politics. And what what this gentleman was saying was that he said basically, there is no political left that has any clout in Israel right now. And so, I, I bring that around to your question on Naftali Bennett, right? This is someone who, um, you know, is is closer to Netanyahu than he is to, um, you know, to the political left is in a very tenuous political situation in Israel. We'll see what happens when their power sharing um, groups shifts. And the, you know, the, the question that I think all of us struggle with who care about this issue is what is the thing that the US can do that will change the facts on the ground so that the leadership in Ramallah and the leadership in, in Tel Aviv um, has a shared interest in actually making concessions, coming up with some sort of peace that is a true peace and a true democracy, um, and how do we how do we cause that to happen? Um, and 
if if there was an easy answer to that question, we would have solved it by now, right? Um, I think we will continue to have you know pressure from the congressional delegation, um, you know, at least the ones who who I think are on the right side of this, to consistently advocate for two states, to consistently do what we can. Um, to advocate for the human rights for everybody there, and and I emphasize where where we can because it's it, it's hard. There's limitations in what you can do from thousands of miles away, um, and um, you know, and, and to hope that we can we can you know elevate the voices on both sides of this conflict who are who are interested in working collaboratively with the other, um, because again, as we sat there at the time, it was clear that. Abbas had no real interest in strengthening the Israeli left, and Netanyahu had no real interest in strengthening those voices in the West Bank who were were advocating for two states. I mean, it, it's a strange thing, right? Like there are there are there are folks in the Palestinian community who are saying, "Let's just do one state," and some of them are saying that because they're saying, "I just don't understand how to do this with the religious exception." And other ones are saying it's because we've got the numbers, and that will be the end of a Jewish Israel, right? And that those voices find strange resonance with some on the Israeli right who are saying that's great because if I can do an apartheid state, I'm okay with that as well. Um, and it's, um, there, there's a part of me that gets pained in these conversations because I, there was a, I don't know how many of you read The Onion, but the, the you know, The Onion um, sometimes throws punches that land too squarely. And they had a headline a couple of years ago that said, Palestinian mother who's lost her son um, gets great comfort from U.S. congressman who explains that the situation is very complicated. Um, that one struck a little bit close to home. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the uh, the answer for the question. So, I mean, but though, I mean, I'll just and I appreciate it. I, mean, I know it's a difficult to, uh, and question to answer, but you know, basically, I think one thing that we could see it from Congress is uh, human rights. That's all I was asking, actually. Not even talking about two-state solution. Is just kind of look at what's going on at the near, right now, right in front of us. And I, I, you know, I think if we try, human rights can be approached. And hoping that you and your colleagues can do something about it, more substantial. I know they're they're working on it, but. And there's one more thing out there that's out there that, you know, but Congressman McCollum has put out a bill that many have signed on. I don't know if you're willing to sign on to that, uh, discussing the human right, Palestinian human rights issues and that it should be addressed and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's I mean, the no. HR, I'm sorry, go on. Uh, is that the HR 2590, the Children and Families Act? Yes. Okay. Um, um, the, the the short answer is is yes familiar yes reviewing I think there is the there's the you know there's the challenge in a lot of these things of how do we make sure that you know there's there's funding for UNRWA and other groups that are providing human rights and then there's separate questions of providing resources through through groups who may or may not be sort of manageable and how do we get that done and 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 on the other side there's issues as well like I realize right I mean the the you know the settlement issues are really problematic it's it's really really offensive what's happening in Hebron right. And um, and and you know there are there are ways that I think that can be appropriately conditioned, and there are ways where it gets a little bit tricky to condition. Um, I, I I mean this is a to make a ridiculously naive observation. The if you flash back to to the Six Day War. There was this discussion of land for peace, and and we developed a peace, or Israel and Egypt developed a peace, and you know, in the Sinai moved back the other way, and Jordan said, "Nah, we don't really want um, that group of people." And so, like, what is what is Jordan's role in 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 resolving this in some fashion, right? Because we're we're really left we're, we're left with a situation that was created not only by by the Six Day War, but also by the fact that Jordan was was frankly pretty happy to be rid of that group of people. Um, and to some degree, we've got that in Gaza as well, right? Um, I mean, you know, we we were speaking to some folks over there saying like, you know, why why did Egypt stop at the Sinai? Why didn't they want Gaza? I said, well, because that, that's not really something they wanted, right? 
and these are hard geopolitical issues. But meanwhile, they're real people on the ground who are sitting there saying, that "This isn't this isn't the life that anybody wants to have." How do we look out for them? Um, and I, I think this is um, a follow up to what Dr. Hollis yeah. Hussein just asked. Um, and many of our participants in the Q and A box are also. I, I think the the question <laughs> is, we understand the two state solution on a diplomatic level will take time. It'll take who knows how many more presidencies and congresses to possibly sit down and have the discussion. Um, but in the interim, what about the people who are suffering, who don't have access to food, water, education, um, property? What can we do as a Congress to provide aid? You know, is, is that an option? Is that up in discussion that can be brought forward? Um, because it is, it is a large concern for the new constituent group that's being drawn into the sixth district right now with the redistricting. Um, and it's not a Muslim issue, it's a Palestinian, it's a land issue. Um, same thing in China with the Uyghurs, you know, what can we do as a nation and a Congress to help them? And, and, and what can you do? Um. I have no easy answers other than to acknowledge the difficulties. Um, one of the one of the sort of wiser and more depressing pieces of foreign policy advice that I got from a from a friend who I really trust on these issues, he said that the the only country that can truly advocate for human rights effectively is the United States, because we're the only one that has it in our mission statement, and we're the only one with the clout to enforce it. And the only human right that nobody can ever really advocate for effectively is self-determination. And, and th this was not said about any particular group of people, but the observation was that for, for so many of the really intractable conflicts in the world, um, you know, whether we're talking about the West Bank or we're talking about Azerbaijan and Armenia, or we're talking about, um, you know, Crimea and Russia, right? <laughs> the, the, there are, anytime you think you know who's on the right side of, of, of an issue, you look back farther in time and the, you know, the aggressor was the attack, was the, you know, the victim and these things swap back in time. And what this, what this gentleman, the way that he explained to me is he said, you know, we fought an entire war in the United States um, over the fact that we were not going to give the American people the right to self-determine and, and split into another country. Right. Um, I think that was the right thing to do, to be clear. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But but that but that, w that within the broader human rights community, there is this question of saying we can we can completely acknowledge the dignity and do everything we can to provide human dignity. And it's a separate. The fallible and narrow and insecure and vulnerable people who happen to be the leaders of those countries where those people live. Um, what are the tools we have to say this will be the best outcome for all the people there? Sounds there. Self determination is really, really hard. And I think anybody who's spent a lot of time in, in human rights circles will acknowledge that it is the single hardest problem to solve, um, which is, which is not, I, I don't mean to evade your question, it's to acknowledge I don't know how to answer it. Um, and I think that's pretty much summing up also what these other questions are um, in our Q&A box. Um, does anyone on the panel want to ask a follow-up to anything or do you think that suffices a good answer? Um, to understand also, I know you don't serve on the foreign serve, you know, the foreign policy commit committees and, and you're really restricted in terms of um, what you're able to get done in Congress based on your committee. And I understand a lot of your time is spent morning to night in DC working in the committees. And, um, and that's something we always have to take into account as well. And foreign policy isn't something, but so thank you still for, for, um, you know, helping us understand a little bit more. It's a, it's a lot more complicated, I understand. Yeah. 
Um, Which is an unfair answer, but it is. Yes, unfortunately, yes. Um, so thank you very much, Congresswoman Kasten, for taking the time, um, talking to all of us, and um, we look forward to working with you and your office in the future. So we will definitely be reaching out to you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank for you for so a very community much. meeting um, yeah, from CIODC. Perfect. Thank you. And, and again, thank you so much for all that you do for, for, the, for, the, for our community in the Chicago region. It's really deeply appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you so much, everyone. And then um, we just have a few more announcements from CIODC, so I'll hand it over. Uh, Congressman Kasten, um, you can stay on if you want to, but um, we can also send you, email you the <laughs> that final coming up notes on us. Thank you. I will hop off. Thank you all. Stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, Sister Saba or Brother Shafi. A few announcements on behalf of CIOGC and Illinois Muslim Action Day. Much for doing an amazing moderator role, and I want to also want to thank all the panelists uh, for for the question that you prepared and, and work with us. So uh, uh, a lot of uh, planning in session for 2022. This is a, a key year, uh, especially for the civic space and civic engagement work. Um, uh, we're really excited at COGC for, for continuing with this town hall series that we have planned. Uh, inshallah, the next one uh, will be announced soon. Uh, however, there are a lot of um, activities have been planned uh, now till end of the year. Uh, town hall is one of them. Uh, uh, candidate forums is going to be another one, and I, I meant to ask uh, uh, Congressman uh, Kasten, uh, we have been asking for a date uh, for him to have uh, a candidate forum style um, uh, Q&A with him and uh, uh, Newman, Congresswoman Newman. So this way, it's a very timely to have that kind of uh, uh, conversation uh, and a dialogue uh, setting. Um, make sure that uh, both candidates um, answer the questions that we're looking for, especially in the uh, District 6, uh, now that it has expanded. And we added four uh, major uh, masajid in the area, which is Mass Foundation, Mecca Center, um, uh, Olin Park. And, uh, you know, the, so uh, the, the, because of the redistricting, the 6th District has grown tremendously. And there's a lot of uh, uh, a potential for uh, a Muslim ward. Uh, to be very vital in, in, in this election. So uh, we definitely want to make sure that our community is making a wise decision and making sure that we, CIGC, as Congressman said, we're bringing the voice from bottom up. We are the largest Muslim organization speaking on Muslim voice. We want to make sure that we are bringing those voices um, in forefront and making sure those uh, are getting answered by uh, by the congressman and congresswoman. So that is something that we have planned, inshallah, coming forward. We are also planning on having some advocacy training uh, to make sure that our youth uh, uh, get some training on the internship for the, for the role that we just talked about with the congressman uh, in his office. And then obviously the Illinois Muslim Action Day is coming up. Uh, please mark your calendar, March 23rd, that's on your screen. Uh, we are asking uh, Jankowski, she confirmed to be there. Um, and this year topic will be on Islamophobia. I know some of you touched upon some of the, uh, the bill uh, that she supported with Alan Omar and a few others. So inshallah, our focus will be to bring them on, hear from them, and then try to address some of the issues and concerns that was brought up today. And th those were very difficult questions that we ask, and we wanna make sure that we do ask on behalf of our community. So these are the representatives that who are representing us in the Congress understand where we are coming from. So um, uh, so these are some things that are planned and, and, and voter registration is one of them. Uh, we wanna have a uh, uh, poll watches training. So there's a lot of uh, activities are planned for year 22. I want everybody to stay engaged, stay informed. Uh, please visit our website, uh, cigc.org. There's a lot of that information resides over there. So, uh, and I also wanna thank our partners, ICNA, ICN, uh, uh, all of, uh, the partners who got involved in, in this uh, town hall series. And also want to thank uh, uh, Brother Fayaz, who was very instrumental in, in, in uh, hosting and, and having all uh, background work. Uh, uh, Dr. Khaled, thank you again uh, for all the work and Kashif and Zaki, all of you. Mashallah, it was a great event and I thank you all for joining today and stay tuned, more to come on the civic space from CIGC. 
So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please reach out to crgc.org. Assalamu alaikum.